um, class 50 on golden doves. We're getting close to the end of section one, which is maybe another two, three classes or four classes, not sure. In any event, we're on page 13, bottom of the page. In the Hebrew mind, the text author, word meaning, grid, ceases to be operative only when, first, the author formally presents the text, and second, it is formally accepted by the people. This is fascinating and so important. Again, you know, um, if Shavim Panim La Torah and this idea that anybody can read the text and therefore interpret it and any interpretation is legitimate is completely false. No, that is not correct. We have, on the one hand, we have the text and then you have the author of the text. That's on the one side of the equation. Then you have the words and you have the meaning of the words. All right. So there's a relationship between text and author on one side, because the author is one who chooses and formulates the text. And then those words on the pages and the meaning of those words. Okay. Now, the te author chose those words having those particular meanings. You know what he was doing? He was intentional. He chose those words intentionally. He didn't choose other words. So there's a, you know, apparently an impenetrable grid. So where does the reader come in? So you would say, therefore, the reader has no right to read the text and no right to interpret the words. Well, that's true. Except if the author himself formally presents the text to the reader saying you have a right to read this text when he does that he's telling the reader not just you have a right to read the text you have a right to interpret the text again getting back to ta'awil so ta'awil means the reader reads the text and can give meaning to the words right so number one there's an act of presenting the text to the reader and number two, of course, the reader has to be agree to accept the text, because if the reader says, I'm not interested, this doesn't interest me, then that, that formal presentation by the author to the reader is, um, is void, is null and void, because the reader never accepted it. In rabbinic tradition, the Theophany at Sinai, um, which, by the way, happens on the 50th day, and this happens to be class number 50, I mean... For those of you who like mystical coincidences, how's there? How's that for one? Unplanned. Anyway, in rabbinic tradition, the Theophany at Sinai is designated Matan Torah, the formal presentation of the Torah by God. Look at it. It's called Matan Torah. So, so what does Matan Torah mean? Matan means that he gave, meaning there was a formal presentation of the Torah by God, the author, to the Jewish people. And Kabbalat HaTorah, the formal acceptance of the Torah by Israel. So we have Matan Torah by the author and Kabbalat HaTorah by the readers, by Israel. Um, thereupon, the Torah is no longer in the heavens, declared that it will be Yehoshua. And that's why the Yehoshua ben Hananiah can make the declaration, Lo Shamaim hi. Lo Shamaim hi um, is uh, based upon uh, this. Right. What did he mean to say? Asked the rabbis. The Birmiya explained that since it was formally presented at Sinai, we no longer heed a celestial voice attempting to explain in the name of God the sense of the Torah, right? So there was a mahloket regarding the Tanuro Shel Achnai, whether it's Tahor or Tameh, Rabbi Le'ezer says Tahor, Rabbi Yoshua says Tameh, Rabbi Le'ezer says, Imelachakimoti, 
but kol tochiach, let a heavenly voice, an oracle, come from heavens and declare that the halacha is like me. And indeed, it happens. A bat kol comes out and it declares, halacha could be le'ezer. And Rabbi Yoshua says, lo bashamayni. Hashem gave us the Torah. What is the meaning of Matan Torah on the one hand by Hashem and our Kabbalah Torah? The meaning is that now we have the right to do Ta'wil. We have a right to interpret the text. Right? And therefore we decide what the Halakha is. A celestial voice doesn't decide what the Halakha is. We receive the text. We have the right to interpret the text. And therefore our interpretations are legally binding. Maimonides declared that one who defended his own interpretation of the Torah on the basis of divine inspiration or prophecy could be charged with the crime of false prophecy. I love that. If a person says, God came to me and he said the halakha is such and such, that's a Navi Shekhar. Hashem is not going to come to a person and tell him, tell the Navi what the halakha is. We don't need a Navi to tell us what the halakha is. That's why we have the Sanhedrin. Right? And if somebody claims, I had a dream and an angel came to me and said the halakha is like this, that's irrelevant. I mean, it could be a very beautiful dream, I'm sure. But it's irrelevant to the halakha. Lo me. Intimately connected with the foregoing is the technical term mesira, indicating the surrendering of a document to the court by its legal holder, empowering the court thereby to apply the rasha to the interpretation of the document. So we have the word mesira, right? Moshe kibel Torah mesinai um sarah Yoshua. There's an act of mesira. So the Torah is nimsar from one generation, the betin of one generation, is moser the Torah to the betin of the next generation. Moshe kibel Torah m'sinai v'msaran Yoshua v'yoshua l'zekenim v'yoshua l'zekenim means v'yoshua m'sara l'zekenim. So m'sinai is a legal term. It also means let's say there's a dispute between Reuven and Shimon, and Reuven has a um, you know a note under which Shimon owes him money. So Reuven is moser the note to the bet din. He deposits it with the Betin. He gives it to them, formally gives it to them. And now the Betin has a right to interpret the note and reach a legal con- conclusion, reach a legal conclusion based upon the note. So that's similar to Hashem. Moser the Torah to the Jewish people. The Betin receives the Torah and now they have the right to interpret the Torah. You see the precision of correct rabbinic thinking? Rabbinic thinking is not fluff and stuff. It's very precise. Everything today is fluff and stuff. You know, everything is, you hear all these things and like, oh my gosh. Anyway, it's, rabbinic thinking is very precise, very technical, very legalistic. And it's the only way that it can be. Mesira is one of the three determining elements constituting the scriptures. Concerning this fundamental principle, Se'ad Yarob, the constituents of the prophetic writings are three. One of them is, okay, now what makes a Sufriya Kodesh um, have the status of Sufriya Kodesh? We have the canonized texts of Israel, right? Those are the books that were included in the Alba Esri. So what is it, what common denominator do we find among these books, these canonized texts of Israel? And there's three, and they are as follows. One of them is that it should include some mention of prophecy. For example, and God said, or thus said the Lord, Ko Amar Hashem, right? So that's or in homage by the Ber Adonai and Moshe Lemor. So you have to have an identification or rather the mentioning of prophecy. 
or that it should include the teachings of some unknown matter, indicating thus divine inspiration. Alternatively, even if it doesn't mention specifically God spoke to me, for example, in the book of Mishle, it doesn't say God spoke to Shalomo and Shalomo said the following, but you can tell from the wisdom contained in the text that it is divinely inspired, so as in Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the book of Kohelet, and Esther. The, word, the main name God doesn't appear once in Megillat Esther, and yet it's part of the canonized texts of Israel because it's, you t- tell from the wisdom of the text that it's divinely inspired. So that's the first element. The first element is there's an explicit reference to the fact that these words are from God, and even if there's no explicit reference that these words are from God, but there could be an implicit indication that the words are from God. That's element number one. We said that's three elements. The second element is proof that the author of such a book is indeed a prophet. We need to know who the author is. If the author of the book is not a prophet, then no, it's not going to be canonized. And the third element is that the nation would accept that book in the collection of the sacred books and collectively transmit it. And this is very interesting. It has to be accepted by Amisel. All of Amisel has to understand that this book is a sacred book. Now you understand why the Gemalan Masechet Shabbat goes into such length dealing with the various contradictions in various books and resolving those contradictions. Because if you can't resolve those contradictions in a public manner, in a manner that's acceptable to the people, no. Of course, if a book is prophetic, there are no real contradictions. Of course, if a book is divinely inspired by God and contains the divine wisdom in it, right? There are no real contradictions. We know that. The Gemaran Masechet Shabbat understands that Shalomo HaMelech, when he says, Al Tan Kesil Ke Ibalto, don't answer a Kesil. And then he says, Tan Kesil Ke Ibalto, answer Kesil. Of course, we all understand, or the Hachamim understand, that Shalomo HaMelech was not so ignorant of his own text and ignorant of this own contradiction. But that's not the point. We want the text to be accepted by the public, by the nation, and they won't accept a book that seems to have these contradictions. They'll just say no, and it doesn't matter that Rabbi this or Rabbi that, Hacham, great Hacham says, oh, there's no real contradiction, there's a deep meaning. Of course there's a deep meaning. But the people don't accept it. Seems to be contradictory, sorry. Next, we don't want to accept it. So that's why the Gemana Masech Shabbat goes into such great lengths dealing with the various contradictions because of the third element. And the third element is that the nation would accept that book in the collection of the sacred books and collectively transmit it. If these three conditions are not met, but only one or two of these, that book is not a prophetic book and it will not be included in the canonized texts of Israel. So when the Hakabim sat in Aliyat, Hananiah uh, ben Chizkiah ben Gurion, and they went over which books will and which books won't be accepted, here's a criteria. So for example, the book of Maccabees is not accepted, probably because the Maccabim themselves were not Nevi'im. Okay, so if you're not Nevi'im, it's not going to be accepted, for example, and so on. The act of Mesira from one generation to the next is what authorizes the people of the book to apply derasha to the book. Now one generation, the generation of Moshe Rabbeinu, Hashem gave them the Torah, Matan Torah, and that was a formal Mesira by Hashem. But then that generation has to be Moshe the Torah to the next generation so that they can make derashot on the book. And that generation makes the Mesira to the subsequent generation. The rabbis taught that after Moses had formerly received the Torah at Sinai, he surrendered it to Joshua. Moshe Rabbeinu kibbel Torah Sinai wum saral Yoshua. You see, there's a Mesira, who in turn surrendered it to the elders etc. Hence, the right of the rabbinic court to apply derasha 
to scripture, and that's why the Betin could do the Rasha. Uh, um, there was a uh, famous question, the Oraita, do you need a Mechisa in Knis? Now, just to be clear, I'm all for Mechisa, absolutely. If any Knis that I'm in charge of is going to have a Mechisa, of course. So please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But to have a Mechisa in Knis is not the Oraita. No, there is no Mishra the Oraita to have a Mechisa in Knis. So somebody once said, some rabbi, and I'm not, you know, let's say Nishmat Eden. He says, no, the Pasuk says, So he makes a derasha on that Pasuk. What does it mean, It's actually talking about if a person is in a war and he needs to relieve himself, he has to leave the camp and he relieves himself outside and then he covers up covers everything up. It's, that's Misfat Aseh De Oraita. It says, V'ayam Hanecha Kadosh. So this rabbi wants to make a derasha on the pasuk that is talking about the Mechisa in Knis. Beautiful derasha. Stunning. I'm personally stunned at the derasha. But it's irrelevant. An individual has no right to make derashot. Nobody was moser the Torah to this individual to make derashot. The Torah is nimsar to the Bet Din. Right? To the Betin Haggadol. Only the Betin Haggadol has the right to make the Rashot. Now, we don't have a Betin Haggadol today, so of course there was no Mesira to anybody, and therefore we can't make the Rashot on the Pasuk and the Torah, on the Pasuk and the Torah. We'll have to wait for the Mashiach to come, Eliyahu Navi to come. Eliyahu Navi hopefully will <laughs> reinstitute the Sanhedrin, and there will be Mesira to that Sanhedrin, and then we can get the thing back on track. Conceptually, Mesira involves a presenting, receiving process, whereby the Torah is transmitted from one generation to the next. So the Torah is presented on the one hand, the same way Hashem noten the Torah to the Jewish people, and Amisel is mekabel the Torah. So one betin, one betin is moser the Torah to the next betin, and the next betin is mekabel the Torah from the previous betin. So it's a it's it's a binary system. Juridically, it is what makes a people of the book the legal custodian of the book. And because the Torah was nimsar to Am Israel, we therefore have responsibility to protect the book. It is ours. We protect, we protect it, we read it, we study it, we interpret it. This is why, although all may study Torah, whoever studies Torah says it will be Meir, even if he is a Gentile, must be considered as holy as a high priest. So if a guy studies Torah, call a kabot. He's considered Kohen Gadol, if he studies Torah properly. But the rabbis warn not to surrender the words of the Torah to a Gentile. This that a Gentile can read the Torah and, and study the words and understand the meaning of the word, that's fine. He has the right to be. We do not make Mesirah of the Torah to a Gentile. Chas v'shalom. And no Gentile was mekabel the Torah. And no Gentile has the right to make derashot on the Torah. An alien may be able to penetrate into a culture and master its peshat level. So yes, a guy can read the Torah and understand the words in the Torah at the Peshat level. He takes out a dictionary or maybe he knows Hebrew fluently. And he can read the Torah at the Peshat level. No problem. Because at the Peshat level, he's not generating new meanings. Right? At the Peshat level, he's going, he's looking at the words as they were presented by the author and he's understanding these words as they were presented by the author. That's what the Peshat is. However, participation at the semantic level to generate interpretation, in which the reader acts as an écrivain, in which the reader acts as a writer, because when you interpret, you're essentially becoming an author yourself, presupposes a kind of commitment to the text which excludes the alien. That can only be done by a member of Am Yisrael. More precisely, without Mesira, interpretation is an act of violence perpetrated both against the people 
entrusted with the transmission of the book and against the author of somebody who is not, who did not receive the Torah, who did not make Kabbalah Torah because nobody was more said of the Torah then. If that person tries to interpret Torah, we consider that to be an act of violence. He is defiling the sacred bond between God and Am Yisrael, between the Torah and Am Yisrael. It was entrusted to us. It's holy. It's a passionate relationship. Don't interfere in that relationship. Indeed, Rabbi Yohanan compared an alien who is intensely pursuing the study of Torah, Osek Batora. Goyshe Asak Batora, we say Hayyab Mita, right? To an individual who is usurping the inheritance of someone else. So Rabbi Yohanan says it's like somebody else received an inheritance from his father and a third person comes and takes away the inheritance. You're not just robbing somebody's property. There's a pers- this is personal. The father gave it to his son. His son. He loves his son. And his son loves, cherishes that property that he received, right? Or raping the bride of another man. They say, It's, it's like, It's like he has had relations with a... Uh, Married woman or a woman who is uh, because al tikre morasha keilat Yaakov ela meorasa keilat Yaakov. As with Keen in um, Oro Dafe, Elias Kennedy, he was a bookman. Remember, this type of reading is violent. The function of interpretation is to possess the book synchronically. Eventually, cremation becomes the order of the day. These people, who they attempt to be oskim Torah, they attempt to interpret the Torah, they act like the Torah was nimsar to them, they violate the Torah. It's an act of violence, and eventually they will burn the Torah. Books will be thoroughly consumed by the most devastating fire devised. Through interpretation, kien or kien deposits the books in the vertiginous shelves of the total library, affirming everything, denying everything like a raving God. So if Agoy now interprets the Torah, the Torah just becomes another book in the total library of Babel, and um, it becomes another book because there's nothing special about the Torah anymore. What makes the Torah special is the fact that it is the only book, the one book, that was nimsar formally by the author, received formally by the nation, the nation has the formal institutions called the Bedin Gadol, which were set up to interpret that book. Every Bedin Moser the Torah to the next Bedin. And you come and you take that book and you treat it like it's just another book. Put it on the bookshelf in the total library and therefore it becomes meaningless. The rabbis taught that God refused the request of Moses to put down in writing the Mishnah or a law in order that the nations of the world will not be able to usurp it and declare it themselves and declare themselves to be Israel, right? It's enough that we, we put the, the Humash in writing and they already the Catholics in Mahshemam, they call themselves Verus Israel, the real Israel. Yes, that's right. They are the real Israel just like they represent the religion of love, right? Catholicism represents true love. Centuries of torturing people in the most heinous, brutal, sadistic way possible proves the meaning of love. Yes, they are they are Verus Israel, they are the real Israel, just like they exhibit true love. The sickest sadistic people in the world, probably in the history of humanity, are these Catholic fathers and bishops. And what they did is just indescribable. So they are as much Verus Israel as they are loving. Anyway, this is why we didn't want to put the Torah Shabbat in writing um, for that reason. Because we were worried that the Goyim would usurp um, the writing. My father points out in one of his articles that originally the Targum Ankelos was not set forth in writing. The Targum of the Torah because we didn't want them to take it and use the Targum in the same way that they use the Septuagint. That's why we had the Masoran, the Targum, Right? The Masorah and Targum says, how to, if you're going to be now the Metargem and the Knis, then you need the Masorah to tell you how to interpret difficult words. Anyway, 
So the Torah Shabbat al Peh, similarly, the Mishnah was not put down in writing for that reason. Originally, that was the idea. The Mishnah is the mysterion of God, and God will, God will not reveal his mysterion except to the righteous. Right? Meaning the sod of the Torah is contained in the Mishnah because the Mishnah interprets the Torah. The Mishnah, Torah Shabbat al Peh, interprets the Torah Shabbat al Um, without tradition, it is impossible to penetrate a text at the semantic level. You need tradition. Therefore, if, if you read um, Dostoevsky, if you read Edgar Allan Poe, if you read William Shakespeare, you can't just interpret it. You need to be part of that a cultural milieu that allows you to interpret the text, right? It's not just, there's no naked reading, right? So if you don't get it, don't, don't read the text. You need somebody to give you the talqin, to give you the direction, Therefore, this type of reader could never hope to become Verus Israel, my father says. Right? You can't become the real Israel just by usurping the Torah. Well, no, you need the real Israel to interpret the Torah. Since this type of interpretation involves violence, the morality of such reading is essential. Or perhaps it is the immorality of such reading. From the point of view of the people of the book, the moral factor alone suffices to exclude a reader from partaking the mysterion of God. So yes, you can read the Torah, you can interpret the words, read the words, understand the words at the Peshat level, but no, you can never go into the true meaning, into the true mystery of the Torah. The Sudot of the Torah, Surah Adonai Lire'av, even the Torah Shabbat Al-Pem meaning of the Torah Shabbat al is something from which the um, non-Jew, the alien, is excluded.